All right, Justin, watch this. 3CB guy here with Ivan Iannikov from uh, HP 3 Par and Priyadarshi Prasad, also from HP 3 Par. Guys, you want to do a quick introduction? Let everyone know uh, your background and uh, how you're involved in this product. Absolutely. So, my name is Ivan Yanakone. I'm the HP 3 Par software product manager. And I'm responsible for most of the software and the features of the 3 Par OS. I've been working with this great team since 2009. I'm extremely excited to present the new all flash array and free one to a new team. And hi, this is Peter Prasad over here. I'm the 3 Par hardware product manager. Uh, work on hardware planning, uh, the 10,000 series, the 7,000 series, and the latest brand new, the 7450, uh, all flash array. All right, great. So let's uh, let's take everyone through the 7450 now. Yeah. I think it's very huge. Uh, there's a lot of buzz with flash arrays in general, and I think uh, we need to let people know what the differentiators are with three part, how they took their architecture, optimized it for flash, and how it's going to help a lot of those uh, mixed workload virtualized environments. Absolutely, so, great. Sure, just so. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the software, that is the secret sauce, but before I get into the software pieces and what, how we have optimized it, let's talk about the hardware a little bit over here. So what you're looking at is a four controller, four Node 7450. You can start with two controller and you can scale up to four controller. That's one of the only all flash arrays that can scale up to four controller systems. Okay. Uh, what we have done is we have ripped up the CPUs and the nodes quite a bit. So the CPUs are now eight core processors, uh, they are 2.3 gigahertz processors, and the cache is now double than what we have in 7400. These have 128 gig cache total among four, uh, among four controllers over there. Right? So that's the hardware enhancement. What this is giving us is what you see on the screen over here. It's, it's right now there's a live workload that's running giving us 500,000 IOPS, over 500,000 IOPS, at 0.6 millisecond of latency. And it will note that the latency curve is at max IOPS and it's completely flat. It is not fluctuating at all. And the secret sauce, that is why this is so flat, is in the software enhancement that we have done for flash arrays. So let's talk about the software enhancements in a little bit. Two big 10,000s here. All right. Last. You're gonna let me take one of them home. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. All Please right. So, <laughs> so, so when it comes to uh, when it comes to flash, flash is really a different media than spinning media, right? And when we started working on the 7450, we realized that the existing architectures is the reason why our competitors have to go and buy completely new storage boxes because traditional architectures are not suited for flash. We looked at the three-par architecture and we realized that and there are a number of elements in the three-par architecture that are totally optimized for flash, but it needed some work. So I need, I'm going to talk about the work that we have done for optimizing for flash. So, this is your host over here. That's your cache. And that's your backend. Okay. This backend has now changed from spinning media to flash. The way you do, in traditional media and traditional architectures, the way you do reads, is say if your host is doing a 4K read, that 4K comes to your cache and it's a random read, so it, there's no cache here, it comes to your backend. If you've got a spinning media over here, the latency that this uh, spinning media has to deliver that 4K read is way higher, about 2 milliseconds, 3, 5, 10 milliseconds, right? So when you finally get the chance to read data from over here, you might as well read a little bit more data and put that data into cache so that next time when there is a read request, you increase your chances to do read hits. Okay? But it's interesting, when it comes to flash, the reads are very fast. There is no spinning media, there is no spinning pattern. So if you're doing a 4K read, you might as well do just a 4K read from the flash because, you know, the, 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 the latency if this is the latency that you that you have for doing a 16k read, you cut that by 75% when you're doing this a 4k read. So, so what we do now is we, what we call adaptive adaptive reads. Okay, we only read so much data from the back end as our host requests us. So if the host is requesting 4k, we read 4k. If the host requests 8k, we read 8k only. Right? That is adaptive reads. This has given us two advantages. But one, it has significantly cut down the latency of doing random reads. Okay, and I was just showing you the 0 0.6 millisecond. That is coming at 500,000 IOPS. Okay. The second advantage that it gives is 
it reduces the back and throughput. I mean, for every 4K read, if you're doing 16K, 32K, or a megabyte of reads, that's a lot of back and throughput going on over there. Now, with 4K, we only need 4K. That's a lot of, you know, throughput and handle that we've done at the back end. That's just one. Another example I would say is just, we do adaptive rides over here. What is adaptive ride? So, so it's interesting. When we are riding, let's say a host is doing a 4K ride to the cache. Sure enough, it comes, we've got a 16K kilobyte cache page size. A 4K ride comes, it only makes it only makes the 4K of the 16K cache dirty or updates, right? In a traditional media, what we would do is we would take the entire cache and we would offload that page to the back end. What the problem with Flash is every time you write to it, it lives the curious. So we don't want to write 16K when we have only 4K data that is dirty, right? So what we do with adaptive writes is we want we keep a bitmap of every single page in the cache. So we've got 128 gig of cache, 16K kilobyte of cache pages, there are about thousands of cache pages over there. For every single cache page, we keep a bitmap, okay? And we know exactly what data has been updated in a cache page. And we only write that updated data into the back end. This gives us again two advantages. One, we obviously are dealing with a lot less data in the back end because for 4K, we are only doing 4K over here. And second, which has more important, is that for any 4K IO, we are only updating 4K on the back end, which means that your your resiliency and your endurance of your flash devices are way better. It's basically one way of extending your flash media's life by a lot, lot, by, by a very long time by doing this. Right? So this is a significant enhancement that we have done for the 3 uh, you know, OS to work it better with flash. There's one more aspect that I would like to touch about and then I will take some more questions over here. Okay? So 3 power. If you look at the flash players in the market, they're, they're very much focused on one or two use cases. 90% of the all flash arrays right now are going after the VDI use case. Yeah. Right? But guess what? VDI is not the only application that our customers deploy. And 3 is known for its multi-tenancy. Right? So we fully expect that we will have customers that will have hosts that will be doing 4K or 8K IOs, but there will be hosts that will be doing 128K read or writes, right? or, or even the same host and do 4K, 8K and 128K. It's interesting, now you've got a 4K that's coming over here, a 4K IO, and a 128K IO that's coming over here, and it goes to the back end, right? So you got your 4K IOs that are coming, and you got your big 128K IO that's coming. What happens when these 4K IOs get behind 128k IO. The latency for these IOs spike up like crazy, right? So you got a latency at 0.6 millisecond. This is 0.6 millisecond. Anytime this 4k IO goes behind 128k IO, we're looking at this, right? So the latency spikes us quite a bit. So we, when we were working on all flash, we realized that this is not what our customers want. Our customer wants a consistent latency. So the way we worked around this problem is. When we see a very large I.O., we actually take that 128K I.O. and we break that I.O. into 32K sub-I.O.s, right? So now what you're doing is one large I.O. you're breaking into four sub-I.O.s, so you do two things then. These 4K I.O.s, if they are getting behind a 32K I.O.s, they have to wait much lower than what they would have waited if they were behind a hand for get there. So your latency is much more consistent. Second point, Flash is a tricky media to work with. Its latency is very uniform when it comes to serving small block random IOs. 4K, 8K, 16K, 32K, the latency is pretty good, okay? The moment you start doing 64K, 128K, 256K block IOs, the latency starts to go like this, okay? So instead of doing going 128K I.O. at flash, we are now going four smaller I.O.s at flash and thereby getting a latency improvement for this single I.O. as well. So by doing this multi-tenant I.O. processing, we are not only maintaining a consistent latency for this host, we are also giving better latency for this host, right? So adaptive reads, I mean, the point I'm trying to make is being flash optimized is not just about 
changing your controllers or adding more cache, which anybody can do. Being flash optimizes, thinking about your software architecture, how is it optimized to work with flash, and, and then making sure that you deliver those astronomical IOs at lowest possible latency in a very consistent way. Does that make sense, Justin? Any Absolutely. Questions? No, this is great. I think uh, you know one of the things David Scott was talking about was the system obviously is incredibly balanced. One of the caveats with flash storage in general is the type of wear correct, that presents itself to the drives. I hear a lot of concerns from people, you know, is flash ready? How do I tell uh, you know, what the wear is? Correct. Or how do I balance out the system more? How do I basically make them work more evenly so yeah. I'm not creating hot spots on the system? And this just seems like we're working pretty much evenly across the board. A absolutely. This, this is where the classic 3 architecture helps us a lot. We do massive white striping at the back end and at the front end, right? So any I.O. that is coming because of a massive white striping, I will show you probably over there, every single disk is almost evenly loaded. Right? That is beautiful. It is beautiful from a sense of performance, from latency, and from the wear out. What's more is we have added a wear gauge for every single media. So now we've got hundreds of SSD media that, that, that's running on 2450. You can actually monitor every single SSD and look at what the wear level is. That allows, oh, it's right over here actually, if you can, right over here, every single SSD has a wear level gauge over there. And the customers can see what the wear level is and they can plan their upgrades around and They that. can also see how well allocated they are, so the SSDs are completely balanced. Thanks, Ivan. Yeah, exactly. So you can see over here, Ivan is making a very important point over here that the way we are using our SSDs, we're making it, keeping it very uniform from a user utilization standpoint. That is a very important implication. You've got very un unbalanced, uneven utilization of SSDs. You're looking at different wear out rates for SSDs, which will force customers to keep changing the drive. Sure, sure. What we do is we balance it out completely so that customers can look at that and then they can plan their next upgrade cycle in a very planned fashion. Great, fantastic. I think one of the most important things to note is we're looking at a for you total system. 500,000 IOPS. Correct. I don't think I've ever heard of that before. Yeah, Especially actually, under the conditions that you tested the system. And it is a four controller architecture. Yes. It, any, it, the problem with the, the dual controller architecture is that one of your controller fails, the performance goes down at least by 50% because there is no cache mirroring. You have to go right through all the time. With the quad controller architecture, what we are able to do, controller fails, no problem. The remaining controller partners up with the other controller and you're still into a cache, cache mirror mode. Right? That's very significant. What and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know of any other flash startups that have a four controller option. Yeah, they don't. They are not. All of them are dual controller right now. Fantastic. I mean, all said, it sounds like the system, the three par architecture, you could have said it originally was designed for flash optimization. Everything was there. It indeed the was. We All we had to do is do some little tweaks actually, and then now we can see the performance and the latency of the three par. Okay, great. Ivan, do you have anything to add to any of that discussion? Yeah, another uh, software that we added with the 312 ME2 release is uh, quality of service. So it's what we call priority optimization. So this is a very exciting feature because it gives uh, customers the ability to decide how much I.O. or how much bandwidth they want to give to a given tenant. So this is extremely important because our version of quality of service is online, it doesn't require any host agents and you can do the changes just on the fly. So I just set up a very, very quick demo and we're just seeing that I've set up a rule where I'm giving 10,000 IOPS to a certain tenant and you can just see in these few steps how easy it is to uh, set up a rule and modify a rule and how importantly how, how fast the system reacts. So I'm just going on my quality of service rule and I'm just deciding instead of giving the system this tenant 10,000 IOPS, I want to give it 7,000 IOPS. So this is a live demo and you can see that in a matter of 8 milliseconds the system reacts and now that tenant is only getting 8,000 IOPS. So there's a lot of user cases that we can, we can achieve with this system and again there's a lot of flexibility, everything can be done, done online and we can simply manage it from the management console but of course, we can also complement it with our CLI. I can imagine many service providers and financial services clients would be knocking on the door wanting this Absolutely. technology as fast as possible. I know many of the firms that we deal with are doing high transactional, low latency. They have their training systems, they have their databases, they have uh, their, their risk systems. And 
some of the clients we work with already, just from moving to a three par 7,000, have cut the processing times in half without touching anything else Great. over legacy systems. So Great. this is going even further. Yeah. And uh, I think we're really going to hit a home run with this uh, in the next couple of weeks and uh, getting the message out and uh, getting some of these units out in the industry and uh, hearing a lot of the feedback. Gentlemen, thank you very much for the video. Thanks very so much, Justin. Bye. Thanks, Justin. It was a pleasure.